So today we're going to continue kind of talking about aspects of immune responses in the periphery. I'm putting the material that we're saying that we're talking about here today kind of in the midst of all of everything we've said about T cells. Um, though I will officially say that technically a lot of this also applies to other things in the periphery like B cells as well, although we can talk about at some point later why people usually think of this as T cell related. And uh, the basic question that we're sort of getting at really all of this week um, is kind of what takes so long and what are the events that are involved in um, turning on an ad adaptive immune response and actually having that adaptive immune response start to act against microbes. And so you can see the two views of that timing at the top. You can see the time of infection listed here. Here I can tell you that I did the infection at day zero. And you can see in the uh, image that there is sort of this peak of the T cell and antibody responses about one or two weeks afterwards. People always want a number. What day? Um, the answer is really that which day is influenced by things like the exact microbe we're talking about and how, the, how you encounter it in the dose. But since people always want a, a numbers, here's a graph that I published that has numbers on it, <laughs> um, where we ha I had peak in this particular situation at uh, day 17. Um, so you can see sort of this delay. And we've got to deal with these issues of transport of antigen, um, in fact, also transport of um, the cells to the right location, recognition, expansion, differentiation, more transport, all of that. And today we're really going to be thinking about that transportation piece, um, specifically the trafficking part of this. And this is also something that we kind of started with uh, last time, that all of our events of the adaptive immune response, particularly that, you know, the T cell response, obviously, um, are generally going to happen in the secondary lymphoid organs. The T cells are going to meet up with antigen at their first encounter in the secondary lymphoid organ. And so we need to get antigen presenting cells, we need to get antigen, we need to get T cells all to that secondary lymphoid organ, like the lymph node, in order to start this response. And you can sort of imagine this, if you think about it, being a little bit of a problem because we're talking about antigens, which may just be different types of molecules. We're talking about different kinds of cells. You don't have little brains or little feet that tell them where to go. Um, if you are trying to imagine these things moving around your body, you've got to realize there must be some kind of signpost. There must be some sort of way they get directions. Um, and so there actually are a few questions here of how, how do they actually know where to go, both in terms of how do they make sense of those directions and also what the heck are the directions. Um, and we're trying to deal with APCs and antigens and cells, and so there's, there's a lot going on here. Eventually, those cells, when they're done in the secondary lymphoid organ, they're also going to have to leave again and go to the site of infection. And so again, we've got this problem of um, travel. And so that's really what we're going to be seeing today. Uh, the part about antigen getting to the lymph node is actually pretty easy. The antigen is not the problem. Antigen can get to the lymph node basically through the lymphatic system, and that's kind of what the lymphatic system is built for. So in all of our tissues, we have some um, local phagocytic cells, particularly um, in these cases, these are going to be, um, so they can be immature dendritic cells. They can also be different types of monocytes or macrophages that can do phagocytosis and then move through the lymphatics. And when they do that, they're going to be using the same general trafficking process that we talked about before. But remember that your lymphatics are these open vessels. 
that you have throughout the body. And so microbes and other antigens will just get swept up as materials are getting pushed through the lymphatics. Uh, and so basically different antigens, different microbes are, that are in any different location of your body are just going to get taken into the lymphatics. Just <coughs> by the fact that the lymphatics are sitting there open, collecting liquid, that liquid is going to be flowing through the body. It's going to pick up microbes, pick up antigens, and just go through um, the lymphatics into the lymph node. So antigens sort of almost by definition of how the lymphatic system works just goes to the lymph node. Um, where it will uh, sort of eventually hit whatever lymph node is draining that region of your body. So you have different lymph nodes around different regions that are receiving the antigens from that area of the body. Um, that's really useful because then T cells can just go to those lymph nodes. They can look for their antigen. If they find their antigen in a particular lymph node, then they kind of know, oh, I should just go check out this sector of the body that drains to this lymph node. That's where the, the microbe must be. Um, and so we have the sort of this nice lymphatic system that we talked about. So the, getting the antigen there is actually not terribly difficult. Um, if you recall our discussion of lymph node structure, remember that there are blood vessels going in and out of the lymph node, as well as lymphatic vessels coming in the afferent or incoming lymph lymphatic and the uh, outgoing or efferent lymphatic that are coming in. And so usually those antigens will just be coming in on the afferent lymphatic um, pretty easily. With the T cells, the T cells have a couple of different options of how they can do this process. T cells could enter the lymph node via the lymphatics as well. And so one sort of choice of highway that the T cells could take is the lymphatics. So they could come in on the incoming lymphatic just like the antigen does. Alternatively, T cells also can get into the lymph node via the blood. And so T cells can circulate in the blood, they can go into the lymph node, and then they could decide they're going to just sort of make the lymph node circuit of the body instead of going back into the blood. Most of the time what we sort of imagine is that the T cells are spending a lot of time in the blood and then kind of move to a lymph node when they want to go there to try to find antigen or something, although we can sort of think about that. Um, basically, the, a naive T cell a T, uh, is going to spend some time circulating in the blood. It's going to spend some time in the lymph node. Um, and the first step of actually having an immune response um, to some antigen is that that T cell has to leave the blood and get into the lymph node so that it can start to find its antigen. We are going to talk through this trafficking process. It turns out that the trafficking process that I'm going to tell you about is used in a lot of different situations in the immune system. So we can kind of start thinking about this in terms of how a naive T or B cell gets into a secondary lymphoid organ. It's going to use the process that I'm going to be telling you about for the rest of the time today. However, and it's going to have three steps. Those three steps are the same three steps that neutrophils and monocytes use if they want to go to a site of tissue injury. So in fact, I could have done this during our innate immune system class. It just, I like it better here. The same three steps are, the, are used when the T cell decides to go to the tissue after it has become activated. So we'll talk a little bit at the end about how we get these variations on these three steps, but it's the same three steps. Um, and so this is actually a very common theme in the immune response, sort of is seeing the way that these cells traffic. There are lots of ways that we can study this process. 
some of the data that I'm going to show you comes from a particular type of experiment. So I want to also just tell you what that experiment is before I go into the data. And so one of the ways that we can study this process is through something known as intravital microscopy. Um, vital means alive. And so this is actually doing microscopy on cells in a live organism. Um, and so what we can do with intravital microscopy is we can actually expose a lymph node um, from uh, our animal, usually a mouse. That mouse is usually anesthetized. And we can actually get to the point where we can see that lymph node. Um, usually we're doing um, a lymph node that's pretty superficial, so it's not very deep under the skin. So we can just basically get it to the point where it is uh, easily visible. And then we are actually using a specialized microscope to look in that lymph node and watch the cells move around. Um, typically what we do is our mouse is going to be anesthetized. We're going to be giving the mouse anesthesia. We're also going to be uh, sort of uh, giving, like heating the mouse um, to keep it well. We're going to have it restrained. Um, and we're going to be able to actually watch cells actively moving in the lymph node. And so you're going to see a few images, a few videos of cells moving in lymph nodes uh, as we go through today. Sometimes we just watch the cells move. Sometimes we actually will put in our cells of interest, maybe cells that are fluorescently labeled or cells that we can specifically track in some ways and watch where those tracked cells go. Um, or sometimes um, we actually will just watch whatever cells are around. So um, be aware that that's what we're kind of going to be seeing in some of these um, images. So, if, so we are going to sort of think about this process right now as the process of a naive cell leaving the blood going to a lymph node. That's the version of this that we're going to see. Really, it's a cell leaving the blood going to a place, whether that's a neutrophil who wants to leave the blood to go to your site of inflammation, whether that's an effector cell who wants to leave the blood to go kill COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 in your lung, whatever. It's, a cell wants to leave the blood and go to a place. And we have to start by thinking a little bit about blood flow. Um, I've shown you this image before of the circulatory system where we've thought about um, sort of the changes in pressure that are happening throughout the circulatory system. But now I want you to think a little bit about kind of things like velocities. <laughs> um, so if you actually think about the cells moving through this system, um, Think about what kind of speeds they're going at, what kind of stresses they are under. Based on their size, so if, if you think about how many you know, meters per second they're moving, it's not like crazy impressive. But then you think about the fact that they're not even a whole meter big. They're a fraction of a meter, and yet they can move that many meters per second. Um, if you actually try to think about similar things in terms of um, your diameter <laughs> versus a, a length um, and forces that you have, this is faster and more stress than the highest level of whitewater rapids that there are, that these cells are moving through. These cells are booking it, OK? In fact, I'm going to show you an image. All right, so when I hit play, you are going to be able to see cells moving through vessels here. And I want you to look and see, do you think you see, whether you see things like individual cells, whether you can tell the difference between some cells, and sort of look at sort of the speed that those cells are moving. And try to imagine being a tiny little cell moving at that rate.
So look at these vessels and sort of the general speed that those cells are moving at, um, particularly relative to the size of those cells. Um, this is in a live animal where we are actually watching the cells moving through these vessels. Um, and so you can see pretty easily the dramatic speed that these cells are moving at. Oh, now they, they actually um, then hit the mouse with uh, anesthesia, so it actually stops moving at one point in this video. It's not super consequential for us at the moment. Um, but if you think about blood flow based on what you've seen, can you imagine any kind of analogy to what you think about with blood flow? Any things in your life that you could kind of try to make an analogy with? Yeah, Rishi. Uh, think about what? Cars. cars? Yeah, cars okay, cars on a highway. What were you going to say, Jamie? Yeah, I was going to say it reminds me of like the overhead views of like crazy, crazy traffic. Reminds you of overhead views of crazy traffic. Did do you have a hand, Sebastian, or was I making it up? I was making it up. All right, sweet. Um, so, in fact, the analogy I most like to use in this situation is really bad traffic of, <laughs> of cars on a highway. So, you guys are spot on. So, all right, think about driving that fast on a highway. Okay? So, and then you, which is kind of what the cells are doing in the blood flow. And now think about the idea of sometimes you want to go somewhere. <laughs> you're, you're not just trying to drive on the highway for the sake of driving on a highway you would like to actually go to a place. So first of all, you need to, there needs to be exits that are like some kind of marking. And you need to be able to recognize like that's the one I want, right? And we're going to get into how that works. But now let's think about it again. You're driving down the highway. Um, you are, say, in the lane all the way to the left and you're going to go 80 miles an hour, real fast. I don't know how fast you guys drive, real fast. And then there's your exit. So what do you have to do in that situation? Yeah. So first of all, you want to move to the right. Why should you move to the right? Yeah. Because you want to get out of your exit, right? You need to be close to the edge. You don't want to be in the middle. So one of the things we're going to see the cells do is actually move to the side of the vessel so that they can exit. What else are you going to need to do? Yeah, Addie. Avoid hitting other cars. What kinds of things might you try to do to avoid hitting other cars? So you might slow down. So what you're telling me is that you don't want to be going 80 and then try to just like auto move to the right, right? Like that might go poorly if you did that. What would happen to you if you did that? You would actually run into others that are moving at 80 and they would shear you in half, right? Basically, that's actually what would happen if the, the cell tried to move over too quickly too. The speed of blood flow would shear that cell in half. So we gotta move to the right, we gotta slow down. Um, I know this is going to be obvious, but I have to ask it anyway. Should you drive an 80, drive an 80, drive an 80? Oh, there's my exit. Stop. Right there. Should I do that? No. Why, why should I not do that? What would happen? Yeah. A pile up. Right? Everyone would run into me. The road would be clogged. Right? Yeah, that would actually lead to clogs of your vessels. Um, and so you can see, just by experience thinking about a highway, some of the ideas of things that the cell is going to have to do. There's got to be some sort of marking on the exit and recognition of the exit. There's got to be some slowing down. There's got to be some moving to the side. Um, all of the types of things that you already obviously know, that's totally how it works on a highway, are exactly the steps that we're going to see here. And so here you can see the steps of leukocyte trafficking. This shows you four steps. And technically, yes, there are four steps. Um, although the fourth step, I'm going to just basically say, like, happens. <laughs> um, so 
the three steps I often think about are the first three because I know more because we talk about them in more detail and then the fourth one happens. <laughs> um, so these steps are known as uh, rolling, um, activation, and arrest or adhesion, um, and then diapedesis. You will see that there are some other names that can be used for some of these steps. Um, I'm not super strict about um, exactly what name you're using, but I do want you to be clear about knowing which step you're talking about at each different time. Um, so our first step that we are going to see is this step of rolling. And there is sort of a piece to rolling that involves sort of recognizing this is my place. So we'll leave the recognizing this is my place part out of this. What's the first thing you got to do on your highway, in that highway situation? What do you want to do in the highway? First, yeah, Sebastian. Okay, you would want to turn on the blinker. What do you, good job, Sebastian. What else, what are you going to do after you turn on the blinker? Yeah. Okay, you're gonna look both ways. Good job, excellent traffic safety. <laughs> Aaron. Turn the wheel to do what? So, okay, so you, you want to move, start moving over, right? You want to start moving over towards the exit lane, moving out of the middle of the flow of traffic to the side. What else do you want to do besides moving over to the side? Yeah, slow down. So you want to slow down and move over to the side, right? If you're going to start on the highway, rolling, which is our first step, is how the cell moves over and slows down. <laughs> and so it's, again, exactly the same as what you've seen before. And so I am now going to show you some information about rolling. All right. Here we go, all about rolling. Leukocytes are white blood cells that help fight infection. At sites of injury, infection, or inflammation, Cytokines are released and stimulate endothelial cells that line adjacent blood vessels. The endothelial cells then express surface proteins called selectins. Selectins bind to carbohydrates displayed on the membrane of the leukocytes, causing them to stick to the walls of the blood vessels. This binding interaction is of sufficiently low affinity that the leukocytes can literally roll along the vessel walls in search for points to exit the vessel. There, they adhere tightly and squeeze between endothelial cells without disrupting the vessel walls, then crawl out of the blood vessel into the adjacent connective tissue. Here, so you can see how, look how fast all these other cells are going. And then you can see these other cells that are off to, that have basically pulled over to the side and have slowed down. So that's rolling. <laughs> and so what you should have seen with rolling is that it is a way that the cell is able to pull to the side of the vessel and with that interaction with the vessel wall 
and do sort of a slow roll, slow movement along the vessel instead of just coming to a complete stop um, in the middle, which would both lead to clogs and would also kill the cell by shear. Um, the movie mentions um, some of the molecules that are involved in rolling. And so rolling involves this interaction between some kind of carbohydrate and some kind of some protein called a uh, selectin. The word selectin has lectin inside it. You may have heard of lectins before. In fact, you did in this class, so you may not remember. Um, what is a lectin? Or what do you know about lectins? Yeah, Jen. You saw it with the MBL pathway? Yep, Rishi. All right, MBL pathway. So it turns out a lectin is a carbohydrate binding protein. In the case of MBL, it binds mannose. Here, the selectins bind to other kinds of carbohydrates. Um, and so we've got some selectin protein that's going to bind to some carbohydrate. That's, the binding is not super strong. And so oftentimes I imagine selectin carbohydrate interactions to be sort of like Velcro, where they can catch, but then get pulled off really easily. And so the cell, as you'll see on a, on a later slide, basically sort of catches on the side of the vessel wall, but doesn't stop completely. It just sort of gets pushed along as with the flow. So it's moving slowly, but it's not going to come to that nice complete stop um, because this interaction is just not strong enough. There are multiple different carbohydrates and multiple different selectins that um, are, can be involved in this process. And so this is sort of the first step of sort of address labels for this process. Different cells or different parts of your body have different selectins or carbohydrates. And as a result, that's part of the address labeling. So if I am a cell who would like to um, go to the lymph node, I'm going to have a specific selectin on my surface, and the lymph node will have the right carbohydrate. And so that's part of the way the cell knows this is the place, <laughs> because it has, we have the right pairing. Um, you can see some of the different carbohydrate ligands here. Um, really, there are three selectins only. I don't know why it lists four here. They are L-selectin, P-selectin, and E-selectin, or CD62L, CD62P, and CD62E. <laughs> um, L-selectin is on leukocytes. P-selectin is on platelets. E-selectin is on endothelial cell walls. And honestly, P-selectin can also be on endothelial cell walls. So in a lot of ways, these can be on a location that wants to attract cells. Well, uh, 62L is on a leukocyte that wants to go to a lymph node. And all of these are inducible, which means that if I am a leukocyte 
and I'm naive, and I would like to go to a lymph node to find my antigen, I'm going to have CD62 selectin, or CD62L, on my surface. And I'm going to be like, hello, lymph node, I want to go to lymph node, I want to go to lymph node, I want to go to lymph node. And then if I'm activated and want to go somewhere other than a lymph node to, say, kill things, don't really want to kill things in the lymph node, I want to kill things like in the lung or somewhere else, I stop having all selectin. So then I can go somewhere else. So that's sort of what I'm, why the inducible part is important. Similarly, if I am, say, a site of inflammation, I am the famous sight of your hand that's been slammed on the podium. <laughs> now I have inflammation. I'm like, neutrophils, you got to come here. Part of the way I say neutrophils, come here, is I put up P and E selectin. And so what you might guess is that a lymph node has the right carbohydrates on it to catch these leukocytes. And neutrophils have the right carbohydrates on them to get caught here. Um, and there are specific carbohydrates that will bind um, to some of these specific selectants. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a specific pairing. Um, it's not just you know, any old carbohydrate. Um, there, are, there is a fair amount of specificity here. Um, and so you can see this here. This view is a view of the neutrophil version of this, but it's generally the same kind of thing. We'll have carbohydrates on one partner. We'll have selectins on one partner. Blood flow will be going by really fast. Here you can see the selectin um, carbohydrate interaction will sort of catch. That will pull the cell over to the side because of that catching. It, so that'll, they'll make the cell move over. But it won't actually stick hard enough to completely stop the cell. So the cell will now be over at the side. The blood flow will be pushing it along. And it will just keep getting caught over and over again. Um, as it's moving. So it's now moving slower, and it's at the side, um, but it has not completely stopped. Yes? OK. So then one more view of rolling. While red blood cells are carried away at high velocity by a strong blood flow, leukocytes roll slowly on endothelial cells. P selectins on endothelial cells interact with PSGL1, a glycoprotein on leukocyte microvilli. Leukocytes pushed by the blood flow adhere and roll on endothelial cells because existing interactions are broken while new ones are formed. These interactions are possible because the extended extracellular domains of both proteins emerge from the extracellular matrix, which covers the surface of both cell types. All right, so that was rolling. You can see the sort of catch, release, catch, release, catch, release, sort of Velcro. Um, what you now, so then we can now kind of move into the next step. Um, and the next step is um, listed here in your textbook as the activation step. Um, the activation step involves some signal transduction. This allows the cell to both get some more info that says this is your place. <laughs> so we've got some additional receptor ligand interaction that further helps with our address label to say this is the right spot. And it gives us some signaling, which gets the cell ready for the third step. So basically, it's sort of a further check to make sure we're in the right place. And it gets us to the third step of, of um, adhesion. This is all done by chemokine signaling. So we talked about chemokines a little bit before. Um, chemokine officially means chemotactic cytokine. So it's a type of, it's, specifically involved in chemotaxis, or cell movement. All chemokine receptors, um, I love, hate this image. All chemokine receptors have seven transmembrane domains. Why this doesn't have seven? It only has six. I don't know. But it's supposed to have seven. Um, so chemokine receptors ha are seven transmembrane domains spanning proteins. 
that are G protein coupled receptors. They can lead to a number of different signaling events. You can see I weighted out all the details because we don't need to deal with the details right now. But the moral of the story is that they lead to things like changes in cytoskeleton, um, changes in how sticky the cell is, and other things that will help the cell undergo chemotaxis. Um, and again, this is all through a G protein coupled receptor. Um, there are many different chemokines um, in the immune system, and they all have sort of their own specific naming convention, just like we talked about the CD system of specific nomenclature. So the chemokines um, vary based on their structure and where there are cysteines in their structure. So sometimes there is a structure that looks like this, where there's cysteine, something, space, cysteine. You can see kind of this alignment. Some of them look like this, some of them look like this, some of them look like this. And as a result, we give them names like CXC if they have this structure, or CC if they have this structure, or XC, or CX3C based on the structure. And then we, in this, here you can see we have Ls. The L stands for ligand. If there's an L, it means we're talking about a chemokine. So we might have something like CXCL1. It's the first one that has this structure. And then there's CXCL2, and CXCL3, and CXCL4. There are also some CCL1, CCL2, CCL5, um, and so on. And so if you see a protein in the immune system with a name that's sort of written like this, it is a chemokine. We also use this kind of nomenclature for chemokine receptors. The only difference is that the chemokine receptor names don't have the L. L is ligand. Instead, the chemokine receptors have R for receptor. So there are chemokine receptors that are called things like CXCR1 or CXCR2 or CCR1 or CCR2 or all of these things just with an R instead of an S. It is not always perfect that things, for example, CCL1 does not bind necessarily to CCR1 because why would it ever be easy? Um, so that's annoying, but that's okay. Um, and each type of leukocyte will have a different uh, chemokine receptor. And so it will be able to bind to a different chemokine. And so this is again part of that address label system. A cell is only going to go through this process if it first has the matching selectin, and there's only three choices on selectins. So there are probably gonna be some situations where the selectin match where it's not actually where you wanna go, because there's only three choices. There's a lot more than three choices in terms of locations in your body. But then we further specify by having to have the right chemokine bind the right chemokine receptor. And so this again kind of narrows it down. Um, and so you can see that Different cell types have different chemokine receptors. Cells can even change their chemokine receptors depending on um, whether or not they are activated. Um, we can also see situations where, um, yeah, in any case, let's go with this. <laughs> um, and so again, the idea with the address label thing is if I pick up my phone and I dial 9, I could be trying to dial someone in New Jersey with 973 as their area code. Or I could be trying to call somebody in North Carolina with 919 as their area code. Or I could be calling any sorts of places with 9 in their area code. But then when we get to the, and that's like the selectin. Then we get to the second digit, <laughs> which is the chemokine chemokine receptor that, again, helps us specify which area we're trying to talk about. And we get some signal transduction downstream of that chemokine receptor. 
And that signal transduction allows us to do the final step. Um, so sometimes I refer to activation as like chemokine signaling. <laughs> so if you said chemokines for step two instead of activation, that would be fine. Um, and the chemokine signaling allows us to do this final step. Um, sometimes it is called firm arrest or arrest. Sometimes it is called adhesion. I've also heard it called stopping. Any of those are fine. And as you might guess, this is now where the cell actually comes to a complete stop so that it can move into the vessel. So now our cell is not going to roll anymore. It's actually going to completely come to a stop. Just like with the previous steps, this is going to involve a receptor ligand interaction. If you try to imagine that receptor ligand interaction, what might, oops, which is shown here, um, what could you imagine about this receptor ligand interaction for t that's going to make stopping happen? Yep, Jamie. It has to have a high affinity. What were you going to say? What were you going to say? has to be really specific. It has to have really high affinity. Why do you want it to be specific, Sebastian? Mm -hmm. Okay, so part, and part of how we make that happen is because we have this three-step code, just like with the area code. So again, this is going to be you know, a final number. And so it's, it, we do have to have some specificity here. But there's another reason why, and we, and we want it to be a very strong protein. We want it to be a really strong interaction to completely pull that cell to a stop. And I'll tell you one thing about it, and then I'm going to tell you another piece of this on the next slide. Um, and so this uh, step is mediated by proteins known as integrins. Um, I was in a debate on a podcast within the past couple of weeks over whether the word was integrin or integrin. I don't care. I learned it as integrin, and it will remain integrin to me. Um, <laughs> so um, we have integrins that are uh, leading to this step. Um, the integrins bind to other proteins um, that are known as CAMs, or cell adhesion molecules. Um, and so you can see an integrin-CAM interaction here. Just like um, with the uh, other receptor ligand interactions we've seen here, um, there is a fair amount of, there are different integrins, there are different CAMs, there's sort of a different set of pairing. And so this kind of gives us a third number of our area code to further specify which part of the body we're in and let the cell kind of know it's in the right place. Um, integrins. All are made of two protein chains. One is known as an alpha chain, one is a beta chain. And oftentimes we name our integrins based on which alpha and which beta. So there's a, one that's really famous called alpha 4, beta 7. Um, some of them got other names because they got named before we came up with this alpha beta naming system. Um, so usually with the integrin, we're talking about these two different chains. They're binding to some kind of cell adhesion molecule. Um, but there's one other piece that's really important with the integrin. So we've got, and so what you can see from here, previous slide, what you've in fact surmised yourself, was that the integrin cam interaction has to be really strong, right? You do not want that, you know, it's got to be really strong if you're going to stop that cell. And Sebastian mentioned that this should be really specific. But there's another piece to this that you're sort of thinking, but you're kind of over, like thinking past a little bit. Do you think that cells have these molecules on their surface ready to go all the time? So everybody's saying no, shaking their head no. Why no? Yeah. Yeah, what would happen if a cell just stopped in the middle of a blood vessel by accident? 
you can imagine th these are great because they're really strong, but you also really don't want them to stop the cell in the wrong place. You don't want to stop a cell that has not already slowed down, right? You don't want to stop a cell that really d doesn't need to stop. That would uh, be very bad for your circulatory system. And so integrins are typically on the surface of cells in a conformation that doesn't work, in sort of an off conformation. And in order for integrins to actually bind to their ligand, they need to receive a signal. So the integrin is normally inactive, and it only becomes active upon receiving a signal. Now, where do you think that signal comes from? Yep, Aaron. It does, but let's, yes, but we're going to be a little more specific. Because <laughs> yes, that's exactly true, um, but we're going to be slightly more specific than that. Yeah. What kind of cytokines? Mm, we could be more specific than that too. Chemokines. The, remember how I told you the chemokine does some signaling? This, one of the specific jobs of the chemokine signaling is to turn the integrin on so that we can get this final step. And so one of the reasons why that, it, that chemokine signaling is so important is because it makes the cell ready to do the integrin step. And the cell isn't going to be able to have an active integrin until it actually gets a chemokine signal. And so that's part of how we're sort of ensuring the cell does all of these steps. You can see the details of integrin activation here. So normally, our integrins are on the surface of the cell in this kind of conformation. Um, I, it is sometimes referred to as the bent conformation. I also know it, uh, have heard of it referred to as the jackknife conf conformation. So the integrin is basically folded over on itself. So it cannot interact with the cam. So the binding site is down here. It can't actually interact with this. So it looks like this. When this cell gets a signal from a cytokine, or sorry, from a chemokine, which is a chemotactic cytokine. <laughs> um, and it's a, so the, where, where that video showed inflammation, it was actually the chemokine um, that was happening. Um, when the chemokine signals in this cell, that makes the cell upregulate the integrin. So the integrin extends um, so that it can interact with the cam. And so the way that these processes are linked is that we have chem our chemokine binds to our chemokine receptor. That gets a signal into the cell. that goes into the integrin and makes the integrin extend. So throughout this process and all of these pairings, the chemokine receptor cell also is always the integrin cell. Because <laughs> in fact, the signaling has to work this way. Um, and so our integrins will get activated. That will allow very strong interactions. And that will, in fact, stop the cell. Inserts itself between endothelial cells, 
and the leukocyte migrates through the blood vessel wall into the inflamed tissue. Rolling, activation, adhesion, and transendothelial migration are the four steps of a process called leukocyte extravasation. So there, that was stopping. <laughs> If you desperately need to see any of those videos again, they're all linked in the PowerPoint. Um, and here you can see those steps <laughs> from your textbook. Um, so our cell is going to start out with rolling, mediated by selectins and carbohydrate ligands. Um, we'll then have activation via chemokine, chemokine receptor signaling. We'll then have firm arrest adhesion um, via the integrin um, CAM interaction. And then we finally have this final step. Um, this is listed here as diapedesis. Um, diapedesis is where that cell is going to actually crawl through the endothelial cell wall to get into whatever tissue it wants to get into. You can also see this process happening here. Um, and, this, I, and this can sometimes be referred to as transendothelial migration, because the cell is migrating across the endothelial layer or diapedesis, <laughs> or extravasation, because we are going outside of, extra, the vasculature, out of the blood vessel, extravasation. Um, and so you can see that it starts out that we have a leukocyte next to an endothelial cell, and the leukocyte actually completely changes its shape <laughs> um, and crawls in between adjacent endothelial cells. Most of what we know about this is it involves some work from the cytoskeleton and there's some chemokines. But that's kind of the end of what we know about it. <laughs> so I don't get super into details. And so that's the big picture of this process that is used um, in lots of different specific situations um, for our cells in order to do their trafficking. And so now what we can actually look at are some of the details of the specifics of this in different body locations. Um, so if we first look at um, a leukocyte trafficking to the site of infection, um, so specifically here we're thinking about a neutrophil that is going to a site of inflammation it travels a lot, just like chalk does. Um, um, the uh, Neutrophil has a carbohydrate on its surface, PSGL1. And the inflamed tissue will have um, E and P selectin. The neutrophil always has PSGL1. It always wants to go to a site of, of inflammation. The inflamed site turns these on with inflammation. It's not like all of the sites of your body are constantly calling neutrophils to them. That would be bad. Instead, the neutrophils are always looking for a place to go, and sites of your body turn on the selectin to have neutrophils go there. Um, then, if we think about chemokine activation, the inflamed site makes a chemokine, which is called IL-8, which is super annoying because that isn't really a chemokine name. So that is the chemokine that gets turned on um, as a result of inflammation. The neutrophil always has the IL-8 receptor on its surface. It's always looking 
for IL-8. And then the inflamed site um, also will um, have a molecule, um, which they're listing here as MAC1. So we'll just call it a CAM. And we'll call it an integrin. Um, and so that integrin gets activated downstream of the IL-8 receptor. Now this cell can get stopped on this particular site. And you can see this happening here as well. Um, that's what I thought. Um, so officially the CAM is ICAM. Officially the integrin, what, they're not even giving you a name on the integrin. Um, the integrin is uh, a couple of things, but I'm not gonna tell you the specific name for it right now. Um, so this is kind of how this process looks if we have a uh, neutrophil going to a site of infection. We can do the same process for a naive T cell or B cell that wants to go to a lymph node. The naive lymphocyte has L-selectin on its surface. That's only turned on, turned on, when the cell wants to go to the lymph node. So at different developmental stages, the cell will turn this on or off um, based on whether or not it wants to go to the lymph node. Um, and we're going to have our uh, carbohydrate here, the carbohydrate in this case, which is CD34, that's going to bind to L-selectin. And this is always there. The lymph node is always a lymph node. It always would like to invite in naive cells. The cells are only naive sometimes, and only then will they turn on L-selectin. Um, then what we have is the lymphocyte has CCR7. Which is also the chemokine when the cell wants lymph nodes. So again, the cell can decide where in its life it is and whether or not it wants to go to a lymph node. If it wants to go to a lymph node, it has CCR7 on its surface. Um, so you can see that the receptor and the, le the lectin, the receptor and the selectin are not always on the same cell. Here they were on different cells. Here they're on the same cell. Um, the chemokine CCL19 and CCL21 um, will uh, are being made all the time by the lymph node again because the lymph node always wants to call in naive cells. Um, and then our, um, we're going to see, why does it use the weird nomenclature? I don't like the weird nomenclature in this table. Yeah, this doesn't give me any better nomenclature. All right. Um, so again, we're going to see an, a CAM. Um, We're going to have an ICAM um, on the surface of the lymph node. Um, we're going to have an integrin on the lymphocyte to go to this particular site. And so um, the, ke the chemokine receptor and the integrin are always on the same cell. Um, you can see some things are being made all the time. Some things are only being made some of the time um, so that we can regulate this kind of trafficking. Um, and here you can see kind of that specific um, 
processed with some kind of T cell. So that T cell could um, go from the blood vessel into the lymph node when it's a naive cell. It will have L-selectin and CCR7 on its surface, and then it will hang out in the lymph node. If, however, it gets activated, it stops making L-selectin and CCR7. And so then it goes somewhere else. <laughs> it doesn't go back to the lymph node. <laughs> Only the red ones go to the lymph node. The blue ones don't have that stuff on their surface. They go somewhere else. So the cell can sort of change where it's going to travel in different parts of its life. When I told you that these things were made by the lymph node, uh, CD34 and CCL19 and 21, um, specifically, they are being made by a uh, type of uh, blood vessel in the lymph node called the high endothelial venule, which I mentioned to you guys last time. They're called high endothelial venules because they're tall, skinny cells. They're, the cells are high. And HEVs basically make tons of CD34, CCL19, and CCL21 to try to call in naive lymphocytes as much as possible. Um, you can see the same uh, process that I've just been telling you um, for that naive lymphocyte here. Ta-da! Um, once in the lymph node, the cells do actually migrate to specific locations. So don't think of the lymph node as just one place. There are also sort of subsections of the lymph node. All of that is actually done based on chemokines as well. And so there are different chemokines in different parts of the lymph node that pull in unique cell types. So there is kind of more specification all based on chemokines that does happen. So once our cell is able to actually get to the lymph node, once our T cell gets to the lymph node, it now can actually get activated and do some signaling uh, and get turned on. And we are going to see the signal transduction cascade that happens in a T cell um, that allows that T cell to become activated next time. And so we're going to be thinking about T cell activation um, largely for the rest of this week. Next time is going to be a signal transduction palooza. Um, so I'm excited. I don't know about y'all. Um, so be ready for that, and I will see you guys on Wednesday. <laughs>